Let me say by way of introduction that Jesus promised two great events. First of all, he promised the birth of the church, as found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, will not prevail against it. Secondly, he promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 16, and 17, he said, I will pray to the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And then he clarified it later when he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Y'all stand with me, please. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. No, chapter 1, verse 5. I just seen if y'all were paying attention. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You may be seated. So Jesus made two great promises. The church would be born, that's number one, and believers would be baptized in and by the Holy Spirit. Now both of these events right here took place at the same place at the, on the same day and recorded for us in the book of Acts chapter 2. I love the book of Acts written by Luke because every page you turn, it seems to explode with power. Now, for those who were not with us last Wednesday night, I want to review very quickly just a few points here. The theological definition, first of all, of baptism of the Holy Spirit is that it is placing the believers into the body of Christ. Placing believers into the body of Christ. Now, Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit, really, were we baptized into one body. At the moment of salvation, every believer is placed into the body of Christ. It is not a gradual process. When you give your life to Jesus through repentance and faith, right then and there you are placed into the body of Christ. Now, chapter 2 in Acts and verse 1, look at it with me. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, it said all, didn't it? All with one accord in one place. Now, this is 50 days after Jesus died. It is on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit came on a specific day designed by God on the day of Pentecost that had nothing to do with believers there, nothing to do with them meeting any kind of requirements in order to get the baptism of the Spirit. They were there, and it happened because God sovereignly designed it to happen. Have you learned that yet? God is sovereign, and He can do whatever He wants to do in your life and my life. You know, it's wonderful to me to know that God the Father, He knows all about you. He knows all about me. He knows what we've done last week. That's pretty serious, isn't it? He knows how much time we have spent with Him and if we've talked to anybody about Him since Sunday morning service together. Now, verse 2 in chapter 2, it says this, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, the word sound is a beautiful word. It means a breath, and it came from heaven. What it is right here in verse 2, it is the breath of God. The Holy Spirit. It is not a rushing wind. It is only, the Bible says, the sound of a rushing mighty wind. There is, listen, there's all the noise of a hurricane and it's absolutely stillness. So all those believers, y'all, are fixing to experience what God has already promised. Look at verse 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. From that time on, there is no such thing as a Christian who does not have 
the Holy Spirit. And that is verse 3. Now, we come to first, verse 4, we're, we're going to begin tonight. In addition to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 4. Now, we see already the word all in chapter 2, verse 1. We come down to verse 4, and it says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot be filled with something you do not have. There is a distinction between the baptism of the Spirit and the filling of the Spirit. See, baptism is positional, and filling is practical. Baptism grants the power, but it's the filling that turns it on. The filling of the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 5.18, is a matter of yielding to what you already have. I mean, that's wonderful. He totally controls you. And as, as a Christian, if He totally controls you, you don't have any problem obeying him is Lord and doing what He tells you to do. You know, when I realize in the morning when I get up at Jesus Christ is Lord, I don't have any problem. I mean, somebody can do whatever they want to me going down 64 Highway or coming over to the church or going to the hospital. And if I have met with Jesus as my Lord in the morning, then I'm going to be in the right sense of heart and mind. But if I leave the house without spending time with God... You know, anything can happen, and I might li act like a carnal old believer when something does happen. Oh, so, so the question in this text is not have I received the baptism. Yes, I have. It's am I experiencing the filling of the Spirit in me? Look at verse 4, and let me read all of it. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the speaking in languages did not occur as a result of the baptism of the Spirit. It occurred as a result of the filling of the Spirit. It says so right here in verse 4. It says, They were filled with the Spirit who were already in them, and then they did this. You say, well, preacher, what are the other languages? Well, first of all, listen. They are languages. Do I need to repeat that? They are languages. The word glossa or glossa always means languages. It never means anything but languages. It never means gibberish. It never means an ecstatic utterance. It never means nonsensical talk. It always means languages. When people say to me, or they've said to you maybe, I have the Pentecostal gift, and then they speak something that is non-language, then my friend, they don't have it. In case there's any question, it even tells you which ones in verses 9, 10, and 11, which languages they spoke. Now, if you don't believe me, you can look at those verses very carefully. So if there's ever to be tongues occasion. In the New Testament, and it is validated, it must be that which is languages. Now, let me say this. It was a special phenomenon for that day. It's not the universal pattern for every Christian. And I want to tell you, I could go through all kinds of experiences here. From when I became a Christian, when I was in college, when I was in seminary with people that I had conversations with, with people who wanted to pray with me in a circle and lay their hands on me because we loved each other, but we disagreed about these things right here. Now, it has nothing to do with the baptism of the Spirit. We've already said that. It is not even the result of the, feel, of the feeling. For example... By the time you get to Ephesians 5.18, it says, Be filled with the Spirit, and you'll do this. And you know what it does? It gives you a whole list of what you're going to be doing when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what, men? You're going to love your wife the way Christ loved the church. It's that simple. It says, Wives, you're going to be submissive to your husband. And being kind to your children and obeying your parents. And being a good employer and a good employee. 
And it goes all through the practical things that we ought to be doing. By the time Paul defines the filling of the Spirit, it has nothing to do with other languages. It is interesting also that some who claim they are filled with the Spirit and thus speak in tongues, they do not meet the qualifications of Ephesians 5 that are the real qualifications of being Spirit-filled. Some say they speak in tongues, but they don't really love their wife. Friend, a person who is filled with the Spirit, I mean to tell you, listen, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, that's a good Baptist word, isn't it? When you get filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to be the right man, the right daddy, the right husband in the home. And the right female, the right wife, the right mother. Sure, we're going to make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, we are going to be Christian enough because we are filled with the Spirit to say, I'm sorry or apologize whenever we need to do that. Now, the miracle of languages here was important because of the strategy of the gospel. In Jerusalem at this very time, there were people that were all over the Jewish world. In fact, they were saying there was as many as one million people there. You could fit 200,000 of them into the temple courtyard alone. And this miracle was specifically for this occasion, for this day, and not to become the pattern or the norm for the Christian life. You say, well, I don't know about that because it happens again in Acts several times. It's not in Jerusalem. It's not with a bunch of Jews. In fact, preacher, it's with Gentiles. Well, I'm glad you said that. Turn to chapter 8 and verse 14. Now remember, by this time in the book of Acts, the gospel has spread to Samaria. Let me turn over there with me to chapter 8. Chapter 8, and look at verse 14 with me. Now, when the apostles were, who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them, look here, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, what you have here is a group of, remember, Samaritans. They Listen, you know what Jews did? They despised the Samaritans. The question is why? Because originally they were pure Jewish and they intermarried with Gentiles and so they couldn't stand them. They were hated by the Jews. In fact, they wouldn't even go in their part of the, in the country. The tendency of the Jews... It was to make Samaritans second-class Christians. So to make sure that did not happen, the Spirit of God allowed these Samaritans to be converted. But at the moment of their conversion, they did not receive the Holy Spirit. They were not baptized into the body. And I asked myself that question, why not? Because the Spirit of God wanted some very important Jews to be there when it happened. Does that make sense? They would know it happened just like it happened to them. And, and two of the most important Jews that we could think of, and it just mentioned them right here, are Peter and John. Now, Peter and John could come back then to the Jews and say, You'll never believe it. The Samaritans got the same thing that we got. You know what God's doing? Do you know what the Holy Spirit's doing? He's making everybody one. I am so glad that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot more people up there than just the people in our church. I'm so glad it's going to be a lot of different denominations who preach Jesus and being saved by the blood of Jesus. It is exciting to know that anybody who believes and repents and receives Jesus is my brother and my sister. It's not doesn't matter if it's down here at an eating place or across the world somewhere else. Only the saved will be in heaven. Let's move on. Go to chapter 10. Now, Peter's now talking to Cornelius, 
who was a Gentile. Look at verse 44 with me. 10 and 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, oh, wow. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and languages and magnify God. And then Peter answered, Who were those of circumcision? The question is. And the Jews, is the they were astonished. They could not believe it. Listen, the Holy Spirit actually came to a Gentile. And it wasn't important, my friend, that they speak in language for the sake of communicating. It was important that they speak the languages so they might know in their own language what God was saying to them that they might be saved and be born again. Look at chapter 11, verse 15. And as they began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as upon us. Look here at the beginning. Where is that? You know where that is. Peter was saying, what a shock. Verse 16. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but she shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them... The same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus. Who was I that I could withstand God? (laughs) Y'all, they got it the same way the Jews got it. And then you go over to chapter 15. I hope you brought your Bible with you. Chapter 15. Peter has made his way back to Jerusalem to report to the Jerusalem council here. If I can get that page to turn. Look at verse 6 with me. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, hey, hey, guess who spoke up? Peter rose up and he said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Verse 8, so God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. I love this, y'all. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. The reason they, they, they received the same Holy Spirit is the same way as to tie them with the way they were receiving it at Pentecost. Oh, I'm not out of breath, but there's another group that needs to be included. And it's that 12-people group of John the Baptist. Turn to chapter 19. Well, we're not going to read all this. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Uh, the same thing happened when the Apostle Paul, to tie them together with the first batch at Pentecost. And this is so, it, this makes me so happy tonight that the Holy Spirit of God's putting them all together in the body. So one part of the body could not look at the other part and say, we have what you don't have. What I mean, what a drag that would be, wouldn't it? The Spirit of God does things right. Anytime you see confusion, hey, anytime you see confusion, it's not of God. You know what truth does? Truth always brings peace. Does it not? Truth always brings peace to us. And dishonesty... Do you know what it does? It always brings fear. Think about that for a moment. We don't need any more special little things when we get saved. Now, notice at the end of verse 4 in our original text in chapter 2. They spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is a reminder of who controls the believer, the individual who's filled with the Spirit. Here it is. An individual controlled by the Spirit is filled with the Spirit. And a person who is filled with the Spirit is controlled by the Spirit. When you yield everything to Him. Well, you say, if you get filled with the Spirit, how long does it last? It only lasts for a moment. It lasts as long as you are yielding. 
I can get up in the morning, go to the mirror, be filled with the Spirit, and before I walk out of that bathroom, or whatever you want to call it, and go to the other room, you can get out of the Spirit. I mean, this is, this is pretty serious. How quick does it take us to get in the flesh? You know, sometimes, I'm glad I don't watch a whole lot of news because it makes me sort of aggravated. And I can get in the flesh real quick when I watch the news of what's going on in our world. So it's, it, it is a moment by moment. It is not big steps. It is not a jog or a run. It is a moment by moment life that we're living in the Spirit of God. And be filled with the Spirit. Hickory with Baptist Church. And you will see, you will experience things that you never dreamed you would as a body right here in this place. As long as we are yielding to the Spirit. Now let me ask this. If there is a gift of tongues or languages, why is it, why is it for only certain special people in special movements? And the Apostle Paul said, if unbelievers are present, they will say, you know what? Y'all are mad in what you're doing. Okay, what happened when they started speaking in languages? Back to verse 5 and 6. Ah, Jews, devout men. In verse 6, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. And were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Now, friend, this was a shock. Here were all these guys that were, had been in that room. They were walking around. They were speaking everybody's own native language. Look at verse 7. They were amazed and they were marveled. Verse 7. Saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? Now, Galilee was Hickville. Galilee was, remember that song, Down in the Boondocks? That's what they were. People who were not in the cultural flow in Galilee. And all of a sudden, these unlearned men began to do this. Verse 8, look at it. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And then it tells you the roll call of the languages. Verse 9, he starts... Uh, at the east and comes west, and then verses 10 and 11, he goes on and on. When they began to speak of the wonderful works of God, then the Jews only had two choices. Either this is a miracle of the devil, or it's a miracle of God. I told some of you a long time ago that when I was in college, I didn't want to miss out on anything. We'd go to a revival over here. And then we'd go to a revival the next week, at one night over here. And listen, we wanted to be in with what was going on. And we went to a meeting one time that was not, quote, Baptist. And there were people that were so excited about the Lord. And they began to talk about speaking in tongues and about being slain in the Spirit. And by the way, that's not in the Bible. And all these different things. And you know, all of us fellows, we came back to the dorm and you, they said, listen, we can't miss out on this. If we need to speak in tongues, we need to do that. We need to be so-called baptized in the Spirit. Because we met some people that night that were overjoyful. And we wanted it if we were missing it. Come to find out through studying, y'all, the Word of God, through talking with older, wiser men and women that... They explained to us what the Bible says. If we get you hooping and hollering, and I don't mind y'all doing that on Sunday morning. It might scare some people to death. But if God tells you to hoop and holler, you go ahead and do that. But if we have to do that on Sunday morning, guess what? We'll have to do it the next Sunday morning. And if we don't, people will say, well, we had not been to church this morning. We are saved by faith. It's okay to use your feelings. I always use that little choo-choo train. Fact, faith, feeling. And that's what we tell children. That's what we tell adults. It's a fact in the Word of God. You use your faith to believe the fact, and your feelings always at the end. Our feelings are always, hey, some days I don't feel like coming to church. 
Well, you got to come. You're the preacher. Listen, some days we don't feel like coming. But we still come because we're obedient to our Heavenly Father. Now, I get excited about all kinds of things. Think in your life what you get excited about right now. I remember when I was coaching ball at Ellison, basketball. I mean, I was so excited. I didn't know if I was going to get thrown out of the game or what it was going to be. But I had fun. And when I got saved, y'all, and I came into church, I wanted to worship the right way, be excited the right way. You know what the word enthusiasm means? Actually means, it means God in you. That's what it means. Theos. It means, listen, it means God in you. The God who created heaven and earth, when you get saved, He comes inside of you. And friend, when you get excited about Jesus, you can't contain yourself sometimes, and you got to just shout. Sometimes you got to tell somebody about it. <laughs> okay, let's move on before I get too excited. Look at verses 12 and 13. They were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? And others mocked them, saying, They are full of new wine. You ever seen anybody drunk? I think most of us have seen somebody sometime. They're, they're speaking out of their head. Now picture the scene with me here of what's just happened. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind. Filled all the house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now picture that with me. And it says right here in this verse. They mocked them saying they're full of new wine. Now sweet wine means sweet freshly pressed grape juice. You know what they're doing? It's a mockery. They're saying this. They're such babies that when they take a little sup sip of grape juice that they're getting drunk. The Holy Spirit, the example here, I believe, is that God the Father, they were thinking they were off their rockers. When the Spirit of God gets a hold of a person, have you ever been in a real, hey, a real revival? And Brother Mike, I know what you're, I know where you're coming from. You know what a, we pray for revival, but sometimes I wonder if we know what we're praying for. A revival, when people get right with God and with one another and you get filled with the Holy Spirit, okay, what we're talking about tonight, things begin to happen. You know, some people, is, they're so very hard to love. I mean, they get on your nerves, don't they? Some people are like that. It's hard to be, oh, they come this way. You're trying to get out of the room before they get inside the room because you see them coming. When a real Holy Spirit God revival takes place in a person's life, the Spirit will begin to speak to your heart. And you know he's got a big flashlight and he'll shine it on your heart. He'll shine it right there and he'll tell you some things you need to do that you hadn't got right with him. It could be that you need to go back to somebody and apologize. That sounds like a big deal, but it's not really a big deal. Well, preacher, they live way over yonder. Well, you need to call them on the phone and apologize over the phone. I think one of the sweetest things I've ever seen. I was preaching a revival when I was in college. The church, listen, the church was an ordinary Baptist revival service. You're talking about a drag. I mean, that's a drag. We'd preach Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then we'd go back to Union. But the sweetest thing I think I've ever seen, during the invitation in one of the revivals, there were two men that came down. Two different men. One was on this side and one was on this side. They were on their knees praying. And as the invitation was offered, I saw that, you know, they began to cry. I didn't know the story. But then all of a sudden, y'all, they turned and looked at one another. You ever seen anybody walk on their knees? They began to meet right here in the middle. Ooh, that gives me chill bumps. And they hugged, and they were crying. And you know what? They buried the hatchet. They got right with God. And you know what happened as a result of that? The, the coldness, it left the building. 
And the Spirit of God came down. And I'll tell you, revival broke out. Later I found out that was two brothers. Two brothers. Then it been, they had been at odds for many years. Came to the same church. One sat on this side and one sat on that side. When the Spirit of God, y'all, gets a hold of you, I mean, sweet things happen for the kingdom of God. And it surely did that night. Well, let me close this out. Well, that's all. What did that guy say? That little cartoon? But it, but it, that's it. Hey, thank you for being here tonight. It's a lot of fun being a Christian. It's a lot of fun being saved. You know, we have talked about being filled with the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit. I have as long as I've been in the ministry. Y'all, please don't miss it. Don't hear God say, why wouldn't you let me bless you like I wanted to? We're, we're fixing to be right in the middle of a building campaign. You know, I'm excited as I can be about that. But the building, y'all, is not why we're here. We're here because of the one called Jesus. And we want to worship Him in truth and in spirit. I pray for you tonight that when you go home, you'll have a great night's sleep. And I pray that it, when you get up in the morning, that you will be ready for the day and that you will die to yourself, confess any sins that's there that should not be there, and receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's moment by moment, moment by moment. And what the world needs to see today is a happy Christian. What the world needs to see where you work, where our children go to school, whatever. They need to see a happy believer. And that will really make an impact on this world.